This is a production of PBS Charlotte. Just ahead on Carolina Impact, there's a construction boom taking place across Charlotte, but can it meet our need for affordable housing? Plus, from elaborate sets to big hair, we spotlight some of the region's best high school theater groups. And in our one tank trip, we'll visit a nature lover's paradise, rich in history and beauty in the heart of our city. Don't go anywhere, Carolina Impact starts right now. PBS Charlotte presents Carolina Impact, covering the issues, people, and places that impact you. This is Carolina Impact. Good evening, thanks so much for joining us. I'm Amy Burkett. More people continue to flock to Charlotte. By 2050, our population is expected to grow by 83%. Right now, the city has a shortage of affordable rental housing. As the population swells, experts say it will be more than double the current shortfall. Carolina Impact's Tanisha Johnson shows us what affordable housing looks like. I think it might surprise you. When you drive through Charlotte, you'll see one construction project after another. Signs advertising studios, one bedroom and two bedroom apartments may lead you to think there's no shortage of housing. But not everyone can afford the steep prices in Charlotte while living the American dream. As a massage therapist, 25-year-old Tiffany Huntley enjoys helping clients feel relaxed. She works long hours and holds another part-time job to make ends meet, but she still struggles to get ahead. I wasn't making very good money, and I went to one of my guy friends and I was telling him about it, like I just didn't know what to do, you know, I'm trying to like find a place for me to live and that I can afford. That's why she was glad when he told her about the vistas at 707. He was like, well, we're working on this new income-based housing unit in Plaza Midwood. You know, it's going to be very safe, secure, you know, new, great amenities. The Vistas opened last November and offers affordable living based on someone's income. When Tiffany visited the apartment community and saw the great lounge, pool and fitness area, she was surprised. This is too good to be true. There's no way that this is going to be something that, number one, I can afford. With nearly 200 units, the community is close to local restaurants and public transportation. There's even a place for residents to walk their dog or bike. Tiffany moved to this new two bedroom apartment here at the Vistas a short time ago. Even her parents were surprised that the affordable living communities like this exist. It's changed their perspective because they realize that it's not everyone that's living off the system or you know, taking advantage of certain opportunities. It's people that are trying to do better for their futures. If you've picked up an apartment guide lately, you might have been a little sticker shock once you open the pages. On average, rent here in Charlotte is $1,169. The problem? A little over 49% of households can't afford it. That's because a person needs to be making at least $50,000 to do so. Hence the need to provide affordable housing for a growing population. Most people are familiar with low-income housing where residents pay only a small amount each month. But with affordable housing, residents pay about 35% of their monthly earnings. So a person who makes $1,958 per month pays a little less than $700 for a one or two bedroom apartment. Local housing experts say 34,000 affordable rental units are needed in Charlotte, but only 800 are slated to be built. As president of the Charlotte Housing Authority, Fulton Meacham says building affordable housing options can be challenging because of people's misconceptions. Does affordable housing lower uh, property values? That answer is no. Uh, you know, does it create crime in your community? The answer to that is no. In reality, Meacham says communities like the Vistas at 707 demonstrate that people with various income levels can benefit from each other by living in the same neighborhood. Daddy, don't press Daddy, press me. Following the recession in 2008, Mike Davis struggled to get back on his feet. After moving into the Vistas, he says living here has made his kids feel more secure about their future, giving them just feeling a comfort of, okay, dad is 
getting back on track. He's doing what he's supposed to, you know, everything is fine now. We can breathe a little bit easier and, and then moving towards that, you know, um, better situation. And this is the break. Gotcha, let's do it. Mike enjoys spending time with his boys, and he never would have imagined being able to live in an apartment like this so close to Uptown Charlotte. If it's not cheap living, it's affordable, so it's not like it's, it's your golden ticket. You still gotta earn it, and you still have to pay for it. I think that's what affordable housing is at the end of the day. It's an opportunity for individuals that may not be on the top rung economically, but they're really trying to get there. And by helping people like Mike and Tiffany get there, by offering affordable housing options, it allows them more income to get the basic necessities. For Carolina Impact, I'm Tanisha Johnson reporting. Thanks so much, Tanisha. Joining me now is Pamela Weidman, Deputy Director of the City of Charlotte's Neighborhood and Business Services Program. Pam, thanks so much for your time. We appreciate you being here today. Thank you for allowing me to be here. I learned so much in these stories. And so we just want to talk a little bit more and help people understand so many times we've heard the difference between low income housing and, and that public housing concept. Help people understand the difference or, or that there really isn't a difference these days. Yeah, so what I like to tell people is we think of it as affordable housing. Many years ago, there was this concept of public housing where all very poor people were concentrated in one building. We realized over time that that is just not a good experience. It's not good for um, the people and it's also not good for the operators of those developments. So today what's built is mixed income affordable housing. So you have households with different incomes living in quality built affordable housing. And when we say affordable housing, we're really talking about the percentage of your income. By rule of thumb, no one should pay more than 30% of their annual income for housing. And so we saw in that story that the average rate for an apartment in the Charlotte area is just over $1,000 a month. And so to be able to have that be 30% of your income, you've got to be making about $50,000 a year. And that rules out a whole lot of job sectors. That's exactly right. Help us understand what are those job sectors, some of those sectors, that these are real working people who just can't afford those kind of apartment rents. Sure, so people in need of affordable housing, people often ask the question, who needs it? So generally, we're thinking about uh, laborers, we're thinking about the retail industry, folks working at Best Buy, we're thinking about health aides, entry-level educators, um, some entry-level first responders like police and fire, and veterans, many returning veterans need affordable housing. So, but what we saw in that story was not like any affordable housing I had ever seen before. Swimming pools, fitness centers, I mean that really kind of shatters that old image of people not wanting it in their neighborhood. Right, so you're referring to uh, two things. One, what's built today, uh, quality affordable housing, it's, it's very, looks a lot like market rate housing. You can't tell the difference. And we really stress that in this community. We don't want you to be able to drive through a neighborhood and say that's the affordable housing and that's the market rate housing. Um, so they do have business centers, um, computer rooms. They Many of them have swimming pools. And because of the way it's financed uh, the, through the state that they have have many more stricter requirements than a market rate developer does. Um, some of those are the size of the rooms have to be bigger, um, the developments have to have a storage unit, and many market rate developers don't have to include that in their units. So talk to us about uh, the market in our area. We are seeing a boom in construction. Uh, we saw in the story there's about 12,000 apartments under construction, but less than 800 of them fall in that affordable housing rate. Why do people not really want to build the affordable housing? Is there not from a developer's standpoint, is there not the financial return? And how do we justify and encourage more people to build apartments that fall in that affordable housing category? Sure, you're, you're right. Charlotte's experienced in one of its greatest booms. Um, you know, th there is a business model where people can do affordable housing within a for-profit company. It's not as profitable, but I definitely know of business models where it can be done. And so I like to think of it as you can have a business model where you can do good 
uh, by doing well. You asked earlier about the NIMBYism, not in my backyard. And so I think it would help for people to understand who lives in affordable housing, who needs it. Again, they're working families. They just might not be earning that wage that is over $50,000, but they are working families um, and not a disruption to the community as many people think. And there are some states that require all developers to set aside, if they're gonna build an apartment complex with 200 units, 10% of them have to fall in the affordable housing. So they have to have lower rents for those. What are some of those states and, and what does it take to sort of make that happen so that we can get folks the housing that they need. Yeah, some, I think what you're talking about, Amy, is a tool called mandatory inclusionary zoning. We don't have that here in the state of North Carolina. We believe that we need enabling legislation in order to use that tool. But states like Maryland, um, have mandatory inclusionary zoning. And so what that means is they have to um, build, developers have to set aside at least 10% of the housing units for families who need affordable housing. Another state, unlike Charlotte, but um, New York, they have mandatory inclusionary zoning. So those are just two to come to mind immediately. So how do we fix the problem here and then we're running out of time? Sure, well it's a community effort. The city of Charlotte certainly has a local funding source called the Housing Trust Fund. So you spoke earlier about those 800 units. Those units have been funded through the trust fund. Um, that trust fund is funded through voter approved bonds every year. But it's not just a city of Charlotte problem, it's a community problem. So we need to continue to get the faith community involved, the philanthropic community involved. We also need to get uh, other public agencies who own land, like the school system and Mecklenburg County involved. Again, it has to be a community-wide solution. So teamwork makes the dream work. Pamela Wadren, thank you so much. You're Deputy Director of the Neighborhood and Business Services Program for the City of Charlotte. We appreciate your information and shedding some light on this important issue. Thank you for having me. Next, I want you to think about a defining moment from high school. For me, it was starring as Daisy May my senior year in our school's version of Little Abner. I know you're laughing right now at that picture, but I grew up in a small town in Ohio and had to make all my own costumes for the show. Being in high school theater taught me how to work with teams, meet deadlines, and get over my fear of public speaking and helped me conquer my speech impediment. I couldn't pronounce my R's. Well, tonight, we want to spotlight two exceptional high school theater groups. As Carolina Impact's Jeff Rivenbark shows us, these kids have worked hard all year to get ready to step into their spotlight. You've worked hard, you've gotten to this point. Let's put the energy in making it a great show. A theater teacher for 13 years, Chuck Stowe has taught at Stuart W. Kramer High School since it opened three years ago. One, two, three, six, The skills they learn from learning lines, focus, co commitment, concentration, when they start applying that in other academic areas, they're able to find success in those areas as well. To take part in the theater program, Stowe requires students to keep up their grades. He pushed me to do better in my schoolwork and so I could be a part of the Bloomies. Students have spent the entire school year designing and building sets not to mention countless hours rehearsing. I really want to win Best Musical this year, especially for Mr. Stowe, all his hard work and everyone putting their hard work into it. I really want to win a Bloomie before I leave to go to college. I would love to go to the Jimmys and be nominated. I've been working on that since my freshman year. Hey there, Teenage Baltimore. Don't change that channel, because it's time for the Corny Collins Show, brought to you by Ultra Clutch Hairspray. It's the Corny Collins Show. Grayson Phillips portrays TV host Corny Collins. While he's comfortable performing in front of crowds, that wasn't always the case. Theater just helped me make new friends and uh, just get a, give me a community so I can, uh, you know, be myself and express myself. The first year the school participated, it received three nominations. Last year, they got four. We have not won one yet, but hopefully this is the year. The Bloomies are just a huge opportunity to show off all the hard work we've put into our shows because I don't think people realize a lot of the time how much work goes into theater. Or how many it takes to pull off a production like this. This show has 40 actors and 12 crew members, not to mention an additional 100 students who built sets and other things. When you get on stage, and especially with bigger casts, it really 
It really brings people together. Everyone's working towards a specific goal. You get to know the actual true person and become family. If the Bloomies weren't around, I don't think we would try hard enough. You can't stop me. Into the woods to sell a friend. From singing to acting J.M. Robinson High School students rehearse Into the Woods one more time before opening night. They hope to win at the Bloomies. Annie Andrews Boger hopes at least one of her students advances to the National High School Musical Theater Awards. Absolutely, yeah, like we've had this success before and we can do it again. She's referring to Kyle Conroy, who won Best Actor at the Bloomy Awards five years ago and competed nationally for a Jimmy Award. It's really cool that he's from here, from our school. It's, it's, it's a big deal, it's cool. And because Kyle made it that far, Ryan Albanez pushes himself harder each time he steps on stage. It gives you kind of something to aim for, you know? Like you want to get better so you can go on to New York or you can participate in the Bloomies. We get to see all the other students, you know, in the county and in the rest of the state who go and we get to just be around people who enjoy theater and we all love it. Described as a twisted fairy tale, Into the Woods features lots of storybook characters like Cinderella, Jack and the Beanstalk, Little Red Riding Hood, and a witch played by Aliana Newell. She says the Bloomies encourages everyone to step up their game. Ever since the whole thing with like Eva Noblezada and how she got discovered, the competition got way more intense after that because this isn't just anything that you can just do for high school. This can lead you to a future career, which is phenomenal. Up in the booth, Erin Eschbach controls the lights and sound. It's a job she's decided to pursue as a career. I'm now going to School of the Arts to be a scenic designer. I would have never gone in this direction if it wasn't for this theater department. Since the Bloomies started, the Wells Fargo Foundation has been a presenting sponsor five years in a row. You know, our hats go off to the teachers and the educators, the principals, the parents, the students that are engaged with this program. They all put such um, heart and soul into this work, and it's something that they're very dedicated to. Research shows students who experience the arts in a school setting perform there. better they academically. They have higher SAT yeah. scores, and they tend Cinderella. to have higher exactly. graduation rates, and they also uh, go to college more frequently than their counterparts who do not have that experience, that rich experience with the arts and education. And you can't stop students like this, whose passion for theater motivates them to come back to the Bloomies improving and aiming higher year after year. For Carolina Impact, I'm Jeff Rivenpark reporting. Thanks so much, Jeff. PBS Charlotte will broadcast the Bloomy Awards on Tuesday, June 14th at 8 p.m. We hope you'll tune in and check it out. And we want to wish all the schools competing this year the very best of luck. And congratulations to all those terrific teens involved. Well, time now for a bit of trivia. Can you name all of the U.S. state capitals? Okay, Raleigh and Columbia might be the easy ones, but how about obscure ones like Montpelier, Salem, Carson City, or even Frankfurt. What about learning all the parts of the human body or learning all 44 U.S. presidents? As Carolina Impact's Jason Terza shows us, a four-year-old boy in Matthews can rattle off all that and a lot more. Tommy Johnston of Matthews turned four years old in February. Like most boys his age, he loves playing with superheroes. And being silly. Ow, my nose. But that's where the difference between Tommy and other kids his age ends. While most try to master ABCs and 1-2-3s, Tommy has learned quite a few things most of us will never know in our lifetimes. I honestly think it's, it's mostly self-encouraged by him. So he, he finds these little spots that he wants to learn about and he will absolutely tear it apart until he learns everything <laughs> about it that he can. His parents started noticing Tommy's desire to learn when he was two. What started with basic shapes, circles and squares, quickly turned into spheres and rectangular prisms. Soon, he was learning the entire solar system. You know all the planets? Yes. What do you know? Can you tell me what the planets are? Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Venus, Neptune, 
Trying to keep the learning fun, his parents gave him balloons shaped like the planets. I found Uranus and Neptune. That's Uranus and Neptune? Yeah. Okay. But he is four, so jumping over the planets might be more fun than actually knowing them. Wow. From there, Tommy moved on to the human body. Thanks to his friend Bob, he knows all the body parts. Then it was on to the states and state capitals. Delaware. Dover. Connecticut. Hi, Ohio. Columbus. Oklahoma. Oklahoma City. Massachusetts. Boston. Michigan. Lansing. And I think you know part of it is is the influence he has from his older brothers, which he has three of them, so he's the little man in a big house. We encourage him along the way, and we try to find where his interests lie, yeah. um, which we're still, it's still evolving. And you know the dinosaurs too? Yeah. How many different kinds of dinosaurs do you know? A hundred thousand million. What? There's that many? Yeah. A hundred thousand million. For his fourth birthday, Tommy's aunt gave him presidential flashcards. A week and a half later, he knew them. Yeah, that's a lot, isn't it? All 44 of them. John Stressen, James Matheson, James Monroe, John Quincy Adams, John F. Kennedy, Lyndon B. Johnson, Nixon, Ford, Carter, Reagan, Bus, Clinton, Bus, Obama. After a local Charlotte TV station featured Tommy, his parents got a call from producers of the Steve Harvey show in Chicago. They wanted Tommy to appear on Harvey's Extraordinary Kids segment. Well, they were real thoughtful and you know, sent us plane tickets and, and booked everything for us. So we really said it was us going on his journey, not him yeah. going up with us. Since Tommy was a big fan of Family Feud, he knew exactly who Steve Harvey was. You know, the, the moment was, when the lights, camera, action thing, what, what the reaction was gonna be. I heard that you learned all the presidents in a week and a half. And do you know who I would vote for? If I was old enough, I would vote for myself. <laughs> would you give people anything if you were president? Yes. Like what? Candy. <laughs> What can you say about Ulysses S. Grant? He got a beating ticket on his horse. <laughs> Let's see, who is that? Grover Cleveland. What do you know about Grover Cleveland? He was president two separate times. Two separate times? Yes. Did y'all know that? <laughs> Ain't no way in the world you knew that. What's a fun fact about President Obama? He won the Grammy Award. I got a four-year-old blowing y'all's mind. Yeah, I do. At the end of the interview, Steve unveiled a gift for Tommy, his own presidential motorcade. Come on in here and get in and see what it looks like. Tommy's appearance on Harvey's show has already had 600,000 views on YouTube, and one of those giant Tommy for President signs from Harvey's set now sits in Tommy's bedroom. Probably the wonderful thing that came out of it is we got in the car to go back to the airport when we were done, and he literally looked at us and he said, you know, I had this the whole time. And he, and he went to sleep. Now that he's conquered the presidents, Tommy is moving on to atoms and molecules. Of course, with dinosaurs and superheroes still mixed in. Who's your favorite superhero? Superman and Spider-Man. For Carolina Impact, I'm Jason Terzis reporting. Thanks so much, Jason. And to think, Tommy doesn't even start kindergarten for another full year. That is one smart kiddo. Well, finally tonight, the story of two extraordinary families whose passion for gardening continues to delight nature lovers today. In tonight's One Tank Trip, Doug Stacker shows us how these families made their street in Charlotte's Myers Park neighborhood one of the most famous addresses in Southern garden history. This is a special historical garden in the heart of Myers Park. Our mantra out here is, is history and habitat. It teaches, it inspires, and it makes me pay better attention to nature. Winghaven Garden, started by Eddie and Elizabeth Clarkson in 1927. And it's a true love story of sorts. They built this home on a clay plot that did not please her one bit. And so over the course of their marriage, they bought pieces of property around this house and built what is now Wing Haven Gardens and Bird Sanctuary. 
Winghaven was started not to be a public garden, it was a residence, you know, some place that somebody lived and enjoyed. But now that, that it's a public garden, um, to figure out the historical records, you get to play detective every day. Some of the trees on here, we know when they were planted because Ms. Clarkson noted it in her journals, but finding things that may indicate they've been here for a long time is special because we know that some of those plants Ms. Clarkson may have put in the ground herself with her own hand. Eddie and Elizabeth Clarkson enjoyed giving each other gifts for the garden, be it a bench or some sort of water feature or statue for special occasions. Each garden's very different, and the vistas that you see, we've got a rose garden that is lovely. We have the original formal garden where we host lots of parties and gatherings, and then just the brick pathways and the quiet little places that you can get off and be by yourself. A lot of people say, this place is amazing. I didn't know it was here. We offer lots of adult programming as well as children's programming for educational purposes on horticulture, ornithology, anything relating to gardening. In 2008, Wing Haven Foundation acquired the Elizabeth Lawrence Garden down the street. It's a very different garden and it was used for research and learning laboratory. Elizabeth Lawrence moved from Raleigh, North Carolina in 1948. She actually designed the house here and she designed the garden as well. And this property is about a third of an acre. This garden for Miss Lawrence became the place where she tested plants of all different kinds, plants from all over the world. She just wanted to see what would grow well in this area of the country. And she literally wrote the book on it. When she lived here, she wrote the Charlotte Observer for 14 years and everything that she learned about growing plants in her garden, she shared with her readers. The garden is always changing. Everything we do here is in Miss Lawrence's spirit. I think this garden's really important because it's a great historic resource for people both here in Charlotte, but beyond as well. The idea of leaving a legacy behind really a charming notion, but a more daunting and noble task would be caring for somebody else's legacy, ensuring that their dreams will live on forever into the future. And it's something special that I get to do uh, out here, is help somebody else's dream live forever. We have visitors from all over the world and a lot from all over the country. They're looking for something that's unique to Charlotte and unique to the South and the area. There's something going on at Wayne Haven all the time, so we hope that people will come take a visit, see the charm and what this place has to offer, and, and join in the fun. How incredibly beautiful that was. I just love hidden treasures like that. Thanks so much, Doug, for sharing that story. Wing Haven is open Fridays and Saturdays from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. You can learn about the children's programs coming up by heading to our website, pbscharlotte.org. Click on the Watch Carolina Impact section. Well, while you're there, remember to look for the purple box on our homepage to sign up for weekly newsletters that tell you all about the exciting programs airing here on PBS Charlotte each and every week. Well, thanks so much for joining us. We appreciate your time and look forward to seeing you back here again next time on Carolina Impact. Good night, my friends. A production of PBS Charlotte.